Good evening. Every day when you turn on your television sets, you can see men and women talking back. Voices excited, their expressions ranging from serious to grim to righteous and even indignant. News television in India has been around for, a, for quite a while now and the culture of breaking news has caught on as well. Notwithstanding the growing disillusionment that has been festering in a large section of our population with the popular media, especially news television, the big picture will tonight attempt a precarious experiment. We will try to get to the bottom of this disillusionment and we'll try and figure out why is it that media houses that own channels and publications will go to any levels to get more eyeballs, not to mention TRPs. The reference point or even the starting point of our discussion tonight will be the latest incident of, uh, well, what does one call it? Uh, some people have called it misreportage, bad reportage, unethical journalism or even a serious case of editorial insight. Whatever you want, might want to call it, it has led the channel in question to issue a string of honour apologies. Very quickly then, the case itself. Television channels CNN, IBN and IBN7 issued apologies in their 9pm bulletins on Monday for presenting a wrong and misleading picture in the stories of land allegedly allotted to the Rajiv Gandhi Charitable Trust, RGCT, by the Haryana government for setting up an eye hospital in Gurgaon. The channels had alleged that uh, over 850 acres of land had been acquired by the Haryana government for the trust and the trust was given only 8 acres of land. In reality, only 5 acres and 3 marlas of land was leased by the Gram Panchayat to the trust for 33 years. RGCT says that the reports in question are factually incorrect. It has also come to light that the reportage also misrepresented proceedings in several writ petitions pending before the Punjab and Haryana High Court. The trust also alleges that the report smacks of a clear bias and lacks objectivity. It has also dubbed the reports, and I quote, an example of sensationalism with the purpose of promoting and improving the image of the channels, which is unethical journalism. Ladies and gentlemen, on the panel tonight, three very senior journalists uh, uh, are uh, with me on the panel, Paranjay Guha Thakurta, as well as Bharat Bhushan and um, Mr. Nihal Singh. Also joining me on the panel is Dilip Cherian, founder of the Perfect Relations Group and also Image Guru. Many thanks, all of you, for joining me on the show. I'd like to start with Paranjay, if I could. Before we get to the big picture of, uh, uh, of, of the media, I want to briefly touch upon this particular case, the IBN case. The channels in question have already issued apologies and will continue to do, to do so for another three days, I think. They have accepted that the report was factually incorrect, but they have strongly denied any bias or any unethical action. Does it still count as editorial uh, oversight then, in your opinion? See, if Justice Verma's order is correct, it means that the channels uh, got their facts completely wrong. I mean, there's a huge difference between 850 acres and 5 acres of land. You know, there's a huge difference between saying that 65 petitions have been filed by farmers in a high court and actually there's only one, one. petition. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, the facts were not checked, they were not double-checked and also according to Justice Verma's report, in, uh, not enough of an effort was made to get the other side of the story. I mean, mm -hmm. so this is a clear case of you know, reportage which was just factually incorrect. But I think the problem lies a little deeper. Mm -hmm. You see, when you look at the NBSA or the News Broadcasters Standards Authority, it's part of a self-regulatory body called the News Broadcasters Association. It doesn't have any statutory authority. In this particular case, CNN, IBN and IBN 7 happen to be members of the News Broadcasters Association. Therefore, they've agreed to abide by the decision of the, the panel headed right. by Justice Varma. So they're going to cough up that one lakh fine which they're supposed to pay. Now, what do you do about the literally hundreds of so-called news channels which are not part of the News Broadcasters Association? Mm. And there have been instances where even members of the NBA were unhappy with the decision of the ethics panel headed by Justice Verma, India TV's case and Farzana Ali's case. Mm. And thereafter, the News Broadcasters Association withdraws. I mean, I mean rather... India Television withdraws its membership of the NBA. It subsequently We'll get to that in just a bit. I want to get okay. Bharat Bhushan's reaction on this. Editorial oversight, is that enough? Can we call it that? Well, it's more than that because uh, what one reads of the case is that when uh, the editor of CNN IBN started tweeting that he was going to run this show, the Rajiv Gandhi Charitable Trust emailed them hmm. uh, their version. And while the channel showed the news item 40 times, the Hindi channel showed it 23 times, the first one carried the version only once, and in Hindi it was carried twice. Mm. So it's not oversight, you know. So I don't know how they uh, deny bias because you've been sent a version uh, by uh, the affected party, and you, and you don't carry time. it. Yeah. You don't carry it. Right. So you know, to say that we accept uh, the decision of the News Broadcaster Standards Authority, but we don't accept bias, is difficult to imagine. I, mean, I don't think, for example, that the editor of the channel is biased. Mm. But mm. some, some, you know, there's been uh, editorial oversight. Uh, and, and I cannot understand if you've got the email, 
how come you carry it only uh, the version only once so or right. only twice? Right. Before I go to the leap chain, I want to go to Mr. Nihal Singh. I'll come to you in just a bit. Uh, same question, sir. Do you agree with Bharat uh, and do you agree with Paranjay uh, 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 on this particular? Well, basically, I think they went very wrong. Mm. They shouldn't have done it. It's bad editorial judgment. Mm. Uh, I presume one of the problems is the TRP chasing after TRPs and getting exclusive stuff. And they forgot the basic rules of journalism. Mm -hmm. Because after all, if you run a story like that, uh, you have to double check your facts. Corroborate your facts. And if you get the contradiction or their version, you have to carry it mm -hmm. with the story. Which they fail to do. Which they fail to do. Yes. Yeah. So obviously they are in the wrong. In right. This. Uh, let me come to the leap. I have a different, slightly different question for you. The NDVSC has, uh, SA has also found that not enough effort has been made by the channels to include the trust's version of that story. The, uh, I quote again from that uh, censure by Justice Verma. The broadcaster committed a serious violation of the NBA Code of Ethics and Broadcasting Standards, especially guidelines related to accuracy, impartiality, neutrality, and requirement of due diligence and verification of facts prior to the broadcast. As facts stand now, Mr. Cherian, is it possible that the professionals attached to the story could have gotten carried away with the story enough to ignore the truth? And isn't that the first rule of reporting? Be watertight with your facts. I think that being in this business, and I have been an editor for long enough, and now uh, in the image creation business, I recognize what, what actually goes on. Don't forget also that while I, I concur entirely with what all three senior journalists have said, uh, Justice Verma's one point about trying to extract extra profit by mm. doing this, mm. I have an issue with. Because mm. I think if one looks at reporting at that point of time, there were several mainline newspapers also running the story. The same so story. So I think, I think we need to right. take that. So clearly there was something going on and some kinds of facts were being trotted out. But editorial independence and editorial judgment is about actually hearing the other side of the story, which is what we as, as, as a communications company very often are fighting with. And channels are now beginning to understand that self-regulation or quasi-government regulation at some time, will mean that it is expected that as a reporting platform, they should play out both sides of the picture hmm. unless there is reason to doubt the, the veracity of what is being trotted out to them. Right. And I think that an apology is enough and a fine is enough and editorial oversight is probably the cause of all, all this, this whole bro -ah. Point taken. I think Bharat, he slightly disagrees with you on the, on the question of bias. Do you, do you think he has a point? No, no, he's saying that... He's disagreeing with J.S. Verma saying that, that there this was, was intent. Profit. No, no, that this was, yeah. uh, you know, uh, this oversight was because people are bothered about profits. Right. I think Justice J.S. Verma doesn't understand the structure of the news media sufficiently mm -hmm. for him to, you know, the journalist who's pushing his story is not thinking about profits. He's thinking of his byline right, or right, his right, own story. Right, right. And he's putting pressure on the editor. So the editorial filters have to be such that these uh, uh, biased stories or these one-sided stories, let me say, do not go through. Panja. You know, I think it's a plain simple case of shoddy journalism. Mm. You know, somebody wanted to do a story very quickly without verifying and double checking mm. the facts. Mm. After you got the other side of the story, you should, in, all, in the interest of fairness and objectivity, you should have carried the other side. Mm. If you have reason to doubt the other side, then you dig deeper, you go to the spot, you find out for yourself what has happened. Mm. So in this particular instance, I think it's a clear case of shoddy journalism. Right. I agree with Dilip. You know, I, I think this TRP business is, you know, in my opinion, is one huge scam and another, it's a sham. You know, mm. we've got at least one news broadcaster who's currently suing the, the, the company that brings out these uh, television rating points mm. in a New York court for over a billion dollars. Uh, this is a separate subject altogether. The fact that our rating system is highly flawed mm. and prone to manipulation and corruption is a different story altogether. Right. But in this particular case, I think the concerned journalist was just trying to sell his, his own, own story. story. And, and, and there wasn't enough oversight. The gatekeepers were supposed to verify and double check that information. Right, right. Just didn't mm. their job just didn't do that. Maybe they slipped up. Fair point, fair point. Let me come to Bharat now. This brings us to the larger question of the credibility of the media in this day and age, especially the electronic media. Uh, I'm part of electronic media. While the majority of channels, I think it's safe to say, and publications, I think it's safe to say they're, good. they're doing a great job uh, under the circumstances. Uh, but has the breaking news culture, Bharat, and the race for TRPs managed to affect uh, us in such a way that our channels now have the ability to move from the sublime to the utterly ridiculous in a matter of seconds, in the same bulletin. Is, is that the case now? 
Yes, it, that is the case. Uh, and, and therefore, you have ridiculous programs, and I wouldn't even like to name those programs here, which uh, you know, uh, should not be you on can, air. If you want. But, but the thing is that it, uh, a lot of these channels uh, project themselves as news and entertainment channels. Mm -hmm. And news and entertainment gets mixed in such a way that there is a race for TRPs. You know, even if the system is flawed, you want to work that flawed system. You want to have uh, a higher viewership uh, for your programs which in turn then you can sell to the advertisers and hike up your, uh, your, uh, your uh, ad rates. Mm. So uh, yes, uh, uh, you know, we have moved from the sublime to the ridiculous and I don't agree with you that uh, uh, the channels are doing a great job. I, I said don't most think of them, I said a job. majority of them, I said yes. a majority of them. Do you agree, uh, Dilip Charyan? You know, I think that there are, there are two additional issues besides the sublime to the ridiculous thing. One is that you're also dealing with a new generation of journalists who are simply not used to what we call old school journalism, mm -hmm. which is hard fact checking. And this is where senior gatekeepers are need to be much more a critical part of management decision making. And I think they need to establish their role more significantly. Uh, and I'll the second thing is that as far as TV media is concerned, and today we're talking about, you know, the gang rape issue, etc. Mm. You know, media is playing a cutting edge role. So they have a great responsibility and they can't, for example, kill off people before the news is actually verified that right. somebody has died. So this is becoming, uh, you know, in a sense, this chasing after TRPs is resulting in a watering down of credibility. Watering down of facts, media trials, isn't that sort of dangerous for the whole profession as a whole? Well, of course it is, but I, I think the problem lies elsewhere. It, it's a, the question is that uh, I'm talking of the old days where you had a long period of apprenticeship <laughs> before you reached the point where you got a byline, for instance, mm -hmm. in the old days in the statesman, right, right. for instance. Now you have somebody coming in and he gets a personal byline the next day. And <coughs> he doesn't have the kind of uh, training which is necessary for this kind of job. But of course, in electronic journalism, it's a bit different in mm. the sense that you have to be instant, you have to present yourself and be, appear wise. There are certain criteria for electronic yes, journalism. Yes, there are different criteria. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, talking about the other point which you raised, about sublime to the ridiculous, I, I was always uh, rather amused that part of one channel's news bulletin contains Bollywood news. Right. I, I didn't see the point of it, really. <laughs> I think we take, take your point. I'll, I'll go to Paranjay very quickly now. Uh, we have to take a break, uh, briefly, right. sir. You had a point to make. Uh, yeah, I just want to add a few points to what Mr. Nihal mm -hmm. Singh mm -hmm. and, and Bharat and Dilip have said. You see, this whole race for TRPs, you know, this kind of race to the bottom, this dumbing down of content, a lot of it has to do, if you look at the way the television scenario in this country has transformed itself. I mean, if you look at the early 90s, mm. we had one broadcaster that was Doordarshan. Today, we have something in the region of about 800 channels, mm. which have got permission to uplink or downlink by the government of India, its Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. And then, you have something in the region of about 300 channels claiming their news and current affairs channels. Mm. I mean, look, you decide what is news. So you say, you know, two snakes getting married is That's news. news. A ghost scene over Taj Mahal with UFO is news. Right. You know, so the the in uh, an hour long bulletin, even if five minutes is so called news, mm. that particular channel starts claiming its news and current affairs. So what we've actually seen is that the intensification of competition in the television news space had no has not resulted in an improvement of standards and quality, but right the just, exact just the opposite. opposite. It's it's seen a, actually a decline in standards, including ethical standards. Fair point. I'll take a small break right now. I want to go to the theatricality and drama of television uh, after the break. Don't go anywhere. Lots more to come on The Big Picture. I have three senior journalists and Mr. Dilip Charyan with me. Uh, we have lots more to offer on the other side of this break.
Welcome back uh, to the big picture. Let me go very quickly across to Mr. Cherian. Now, Mr. Cherian, uh, this is a very uh, simple question. It, it's not just this particular story. If you take a look at most of our news channels, I know that the thrust used to be on the weight of the story and, and on the facts of the story. Do you think the era of uh, heavily corporate-owned media and TRPs has turned Indian television, news television, on its head now? And the focus is now only on theatricality and drama. News television in India seems to be one big reality show these days. I think it's got to do with the definition of news. Mm. And I think we need to have uh, advertising budgets chase TRP figures. And I think all that is about to, uh, about to change with, uh, with all this digitization. Mm. So let's, let's hope for a new dawn to begin there. But having said that, I think if you don't define news channels more, more, more water, in a watertight kind of manner, mm. then you're running into this problem of racing to the bottom. Because anything can be defined as news, Bollywood and cricket combined takes up on some channels more news space than any other, any other thing which passes for news. Mm. So I think that's dangerous. The second thing is theatricality is, is unfortunately the way younger people are living. So they are used to theatrics, they are used to a lot more of sensationalized stuff. So you have to understand that somewhere there is this pull and pressure and as a result, news is suffering. Is, 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 I'm calling it suffering, but maybe the younger people actually want it. So I, I don't know what, whether we are defining it entirely right. It's a generational thing too. Mr. Nihal Singh, are editors and editorial, uh, editorial uh, call takers crumbling under the pressure of theatricality to, to, to adjust for the new uh, audience now? Well, I think the American television example is a very baleful one for, for mm. the Indian television mm. industry. And you see that on one particular channel. Yeah. You know, when you are aggressive, even mm. when you present a news item, you present it aggressively, in your face kind of thing. I don't think that is very uh, welcome as far as I'm concerned. And I think most viewers are concerned. But the theatricality element is, has to come in to a certain extent. It's a question of how you, you deal with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the BBC broadcast by contrast with American television, mm -hmm. say CNN, mm -hmm. or any of the others, ABC and so on. So uh, that has to come in. As far as the dumbing down of news is concerned, it is a given in electronic media. Right, so, so, so uh, you, nothing we can do to escape it then? You can't escape it. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go to Bharat Bhushan, break <laughs> it down for us. What has happened, Bharat Bhushan? Uh, what stops editors and editorial call takers uh, to stop this? Why do they stoke this? Have we let our viewers down? Have we let our democracy down? Are, we are the fourth estate. Have we let our, in the race to be sabse tez, have we forgotten everything else? You have to look at how the structure of uh, news media has changed. Uh, you're right, editors don't have the same kind of role they used to have earlier. Mm. Today, you're selling audiences and viewerships and viewership profiles to potential advertisers. Okay? And then uh, the marketing department has uh, become the predominantly uh, important department in, in, in newsrooms. So marketing directors would often direct uh, uh, the, the, the scope of news and what is news and what kind of news you should give. Mm. As far as theatricality is concerned, I think some of it is built into a visual media. Suppose you're reporting on war from mm. the war mm. front. That theatricality is already built into the situation. Then there is theatricality that you assume, <laughs> like some anchors assume that theat theatricality, as Mr. Nihal Singh was saying. Because you know, they themselves become news. They start thinking that they are setting the national agenda. You know, they start fooling themselves. Right. And some viewers like it. And if that viewership profile is of socioeconomic category A1, A2, then it is very easy to sell it to advertisers. You get better advertising. Right. So, so it's a vicious cycle. But editors have lost the battle to marketing directors. Is it all commerce now then? Much of it is. You know, we see some of the major corporates in the country today becoming, you know, controllers of large media organizations. Some of the wealthiest it's individuals. It's a constant process. It keeps happening. That's right. No, it's been happening across yes. the world. We're seeing convergence. We're seeing consolidation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to add to what uh, Bharat says, this whole issue of who determines what goes on air or what is read by people or what is listened to. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, 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 uh, the editor's role has indeed diminished and that of the marketing executives have indeed gone up or for that matter, the, 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 the proprietor. What we are actually seeing is the total advertising pie for news channels hasn't really grown very fast on account of a variety of reasons. And across the world, there's been a worldwide recession. Mm. In this country, there's been a sharp economic slowdown. So what is happening? You're having more and more players 
vying to grab the, a thin sliver of that advertising pie. Mm. And therefore, the temptation to, you know, be sensational, to sens you know, to sensationalize. So there are some of your favorite anchors who want, who want to save the nation every, every evening for you. So that kind of temptation is there to sensationalize and and dumbing down is not new dumbing down has been going on it's for, been happening for a while. It, it's a bit like the, the the serials you know where you have canned laughter in the background right, after right. a joke is cracked right. your intelligence is insulted because right. they tell you a joke has been cracked please laugh now uh, Bharat, then then I, I, I agree with uh, Paranjay in the newspaper business in in any big city the number one uh, newspaper takes away nearly 90 percent of the ad revenue and the rest are competing for that 10 percent mm. uh, I don't know whether the same thing happens in the TV business but if the advertising pie is limited, then people try and grab that pie by doing various things. For example, your programs like uh, Sansani, mm. uh, which is run by uh, 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 somebody who's trained in theater. Right. He's, he doesn't come from journalism. Right. You have uh, crime shows, ACP something or the other, where the anchor dresses up as uh, assistant commissioner of police and then presents it. Right. So it's all the race for that limited the advertising last pie. Last sliver of advertising, the, the advertising pie. Yeah. Yes, uh, Mr. I think Chair. the more important and the big, the big debate ought, ought to be that this concept of the fourth estate has television journalism abdicated that role mm. in the in the race to commercialism because the example that Mr. Nihal Singh used of BBC versus uh, American broadcast television mm. news television the the big difference is that both societies have evolved very fast mm. but British television has remained much more careful and measured when news is concerned because of the role of the BBC. Mm. So the, if the anchor channel, as it were, mm. plays that role and has a more responsible attitude towards it, mm. instead of this whole race to the bottom thing that both Paranjoy mm. and Bharat mm. have been referring to, then you have the chance of behaving like the fourth estate. Otherwise, it'll get, be, uh, it'll get treated like an extension of Bollywood. Has, has the electronic media abdicated that responsibility? Well, the point is I'd like to come back to print first. Yeah. Look at it to what's hap what is happening in the print media in India. I mean, I, as a editor of the Statesman, had the final word of anything going into the paper, mm. including advertising, mm. when I was editor. And we had only one advertisement in a certain place on page one. Mm. Uh, where it was absolutely fixed. If for half a centimeter, I had to approve. Those in, were the old days, but what in the happened old days. now? Oh. So, what has happened now is that there's hardly any, uh, I mean, the, in some newspapers, mm -hmm. uh, which we all know about, mm. there's not even an editor officially right, right, who's right. running the paper. Right. So, that, you, if you translate into the electronic media, is more acute. Right. Because it's a newer media. I have a question for all my four guests, and, and I'll come to you one by one. What is the way out of this? What can we do? When I say we, I mean journalists, editors, media houses, reporters, the media fraternity, if I could call it that. Uh, to bring back the sort of respectability and credibility that used to be attached with this uh, uh, particular profession. I apologize if I sound slightly disillusioned, but the popular perception, uh, uh, gentlemen, these days is that the media is just one big circus of talking heads screaming and shouting at each other. And uh, whenever, whatever airtime is left is taken up by half-baked, unverified, uh, speculative reports. Please feel free to admonish me if I'm going too far, starting with you, Mr. Paranjay. No, no, what you're saying is, uh, is quite accurate. I'm, mm. I'm not denying what you're saying. Mm. You know, uh, what, what Bharat said earlier, if you don't look on information as a public good, if you're too busy trying to reach consumers to advertisers, and you're not bothered about pro providing information to citizens, then this entire activity becomes excessively hyper-commercialized. Mm. Now, what you're seeing, what is the way forward? You know, at the end of the day, self-regulation in an ideal world is the best form of regulation. But what do you do in the case of rogue elements? What do you do in the case of journalists who are accused of not just unethical practices, but criminal practices, mm. including, say, the recent case where two journalists have been accused of extortion mm. and blackmail? Mm. Mm. So I think at the way forward, we have a press council of India, which is a toothless body. It has no powers to punish, though it's a quasi-judicial body set up by an act of parliament. Mm. For the broadcast media, we only have self-regulatory bodies other than the Ministry of Information Broadcasting. Mm. I think it's about time India set up a body which is like a constitutional authority. It could be funded by the government, but it ha has to be independent and autonomous and of the word government. And it has to be binding. And it has to be, uh, it has to have powers. It has to have powers, including punitive powers to, to punish the rogue elements. Right, absolutely. By and large, Point the media taken. may be responsible. Point taken. But First, Bharat, then Mr. Chari and then Mr. Nair. Okay, I think there are two things here. Uh, uh, what is it that we can do internally 
uh, to to, to uh, make Stem the more credible. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we really need to have a, a training period for journalists where they they taught about uh, media ethics. What you know, how to, you know uh, uh, that that truth is multifaceted. That they should look at all sides mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of a story, bring them in a complex story, a layered story, a much better story. This has to go down. Secondly, I think they, they, we have to introduce a system of mentoring uh, where you know you attach young journalists to some senior journalist who mentors him, who uh, actually uh, you know guides him and handholds him. Mm. The third uh, thing that you need to do internally is have a system of uh, rewards and punishment. If uh, you know people who are uh, uh, you know uh, th there are there are journalists who who take bribes, there are journalists who are on the payroll of corporates. Such journalists must be weeded out. Once they are caught, they must be punished. People should see mm. that good ethics is rewarded. And uh, those who uh, don't have any they ethical norms are right. exact. Right. Institutionally, uh, you know, I would not say immediately that set up a, a media council, give it punitive powers. I would say set up something like the Levison Inquiry, maybe another uh, press commission, mm -hmm. which actually goes around the country, talks to people, mm. talks to journalists, their organizations, even uh, newspaper owners, mm. readers, mm. all stakeholders. And then think of what kind of institutional mechanism you need to bring the, the rogues to book. Fair point, Mr. Cherian. You know, I'm not an advocate of kind of uh, slow process. I think there is a media crisis which is right here and right now. Uh, you need punitive action, you need a powerful press council or whatever you call it, and you need to make sure that you name and shame the individuals and the organizations who are behind reporting uh, in a culpable manner. So the danger is here, and danger is now, we have to act. Now. We have to right. act today. Right, Mr. Nihal sir. Well, I agree about the training part. He, that is very, very sorely needed, uh, what Bhaya Bhushan said. But I, I would go further and say that uh, the problem really is with any statutory body that I'd be very scared of constitutional authority mm. because you, we have the press council, which is toothless, okay. Mm. But you have a chairman of uh, the head of the press council who's a loose cannon, uh, who is talking about the universe instead of uh, <laughs> dealing with the affairs of the press. Fair enough. So I would be very skeptical <coughs> about any government-aided organization which sits in judgment on the media, right. whether it is print or electronic. And I would say that there should be a powerful self-regulating body of peers. And there should be enough uh, publicity given to it to shame the, the wrongdoers. The, anyone who's heard. If, if, if I can clarify. Very briefly, yeah. My position. You know, why should the head of the Press Council of India be a retired judge of the Supreme Court? Why can it not be a senior journalist? Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm talking about government mm -hmm. funding, I don't mean, why not have the autonomy of an election commission of India or a controller and auditor general of India or a Supreme Court of India, which I think may be funded by the government, but is independent. Them? Who appoints them? That is a pertinent and, point. We'll, I think, we'll, I think we'll, we'll end with those two questions. Why not have someone who's not just a judge and who appoints them? Those are, those are two questions I'll end end with my show with. I must thank all my guests before I leave. Paranjoy Guha Thakur, many thanks for joining us. Bharat Bhushan, Dilip Cheryan, as well as Mr. S. Nihal Singh. I must thank all these gentlemen who came on the show and I think the debate was uh, pretty uh, self-explanatory. Uh, the rot is here, the danger is here and now we must save ourselves. Athar Khan saying goodbye, good night, and thank you for watching The Big Picture.